Welcome to the third season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. We're an independent podcast with over 125 free episodes. We love what we do and are dying to continue. If you enjoy listening to Murder in 20 every week, we'd be eternally grateful for your support by visiting Murder in 20 at Patreon, PayPal, or Murderin20.com. Thank you for helping us keep our creative minds riding into the wee hours of the night. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. Irene grew up in the outskirts of Los Angeles in California, a pretty young woman with long dark hair. Just out of high school, she married Ernie, a boy that all the girls swooned over. First, they had Ernie Jr., then along came Mark. Third was Michelle, the little angel they nicknamed Missy. A few years later, along came Chris. Growing up, Irene and Missy were close. Although much tinier than her husky brothers, she was a tomboy who played outside with them in their toy trucks. But every once in a while, Irene got the chance to dress Missy in frills and lace and fulfilled her motherly dreams. Just down the street in a middle-class neighborhood in Arlita, Missy Avila grew up with Karen Severson and Laura Doyle. Missy was fiercely loyal, and the three girls were best friends. They shared Barbies, sleepovers, and giggled over boys. The threesome were like sisters and attended the same schools. Irene treated Karen and Laura like family, and they referred to her as their second mother. Karen and Missy were polar opposites physically. While Missy was petite, Karen was tall and hefty. And when people poked fun at Karen, Missy was always there to defend her. Missy was smart and in elementary school attended a class for gifted children and had dreams of one day becoming a physical therapist. But soon, the lure of a good time was too hard to pass up. She and Karen began skipping classes and fell behind. They were transferred to a school for students who needed extra help. The two girls shared a tight bond, but with Karen, it became much more like an obsession. She became oddly possessive of Missy. Where Missy went, Karen followed. When new friends approached Missy, she'd scare them away. Missy was her friend, not theirs. The girls often drove to Colby Canyon in the Angeles National Forest. A narrow one-lane road led to a small clearing where they hung out. The floor of the canyon was littered with gravel. Craggy boulders jutted out of the steep foothills. Between the rocks spread its scraggly green shrubs. Every now and then, a tree dotted the hills. Their trunks etched with the names of Scratched into the bark of one of them were the words Missy, Karen, Forever. At the bottom of the ravine laid a small creek. There, teenagers found solace in having a beer and experimenting with drugs. A place of their own, hidden from judgment. Irene and Ernie divorced. She and Missy became even closer. Irene valued her friendship with Missy and was a little more lenient than other parents. Missy confided in her about the boys and some of the things she was up to. And Irene tried not to judge. She remembered what it was like to be young and pretty. But her daughter didn't tell her everything. As they entered junior high, the childhood friends who'd been so close for a decade 
began to drift apart. Karen was tall and substantially heavy at almost 200 pounds. Her dark hair, parted in the middle, elongated her face and pointed chin. She verbally lashed out at her peers and often got into fights. Then she got pregnant and became a single mom. Her time was nil spent with babies and bottles. She became jealous of Missy and her freedom, her popularity, and watched her live the life she wanted. The Los Angeles Times describes how Laura became intense with an explosive personality, who thought nothing of using the pointed end of a paper clip to carve her boyfriend's initials into the palm of her hand. Her dirty blonde hair graced her collarbone. Bangs framed her beady eyes. Her lips turned down at the corners, as if she was always angry. Whereas Missy was blooming into a beautiful teenager, although only five foot two and ninety pounds, her body had filled out in all the right places. Her green eyes twinkled above her chubby cheeks. Her chestnut brown hair flowed freely down to her waist. She began to hang out with a different crowd and dabbled in drugs, much like many teenagers before her. In September 1985, Karen was living with Randy. They'd even carved their initials in a tree up in the canyon. Before they got together, Missy and Randy had briefly dated. And while it didn't work out for them, Missy was really happy for Karen and Randy. Missy always tried to do the right thing and be everyone's friend. But Karen and Laura no longer saw it that way. They felt their best friend was always flirting with boys and going after their boyfriends. The three best friends dwindled down to two. And Missy was on the outside. Only she didn't know it. She knew they were upset with her and thought it would just blow over like it did when they were kids. Karen hadn't been speaking to Missy for a couple of weeks. When she was at a park with friends, Missy showed up. And Karen started yelling at her, pushed her, and ended up slapping her. <laughs> friends stepped in and broke up the fight. Then one night, Karen and her roommate Eva stopped by Irene's house and began telling her a lot of naughty things about her daughter. They accused her of flirting with boys and snatching their boyfriends, but Irene wouldn't hear it and ordered them to get out. Missy's older brother Mark tried to talk to his sister, warned her about drugs, and told her to stop hanging out with her friends. They weren't good for her. The two ended up in a big argument and stopped speaking to one another. Karen and Laura's jealousy of Missy escalated to hatred, and they decided to confront her. Summer had just eased into fall. The temperature October 1st was still a warm 73 degrees, and the skies were blue with a light wind. Laura invited Missy to hang out. After school, Missy told her mother she'd be home by 8, and if she was going to be late, she'd call. Laura stopped by just after 3 p.m. Irene and her younger brother Chris were sitting in the front yard. Missy ran past them to Laura's car, then stopped, turned around, and ran back and told them that she loved them. Eva joined Karen in her car, and they followed Laura and Missy. Karen told Eva that they planned to scare Missy. It took 45 minutes to drive up to the spot in the canyon, down the narrow road, and just past the Colby Bridge. They came to a clearing near a creek and parked. Karen and Laura got out of their cars and walked over to Missy, who was just sitting in the passenger seat. They started yelling at her. Laura grabbed her by the wrist and said they were going for a walk. 
the four hiked down the embankment to the creek. Karen and Laura pushed Missy along the dirt path towards the water. Laura tied Missy's hands behind her back. Then Karen and Laura started accusing Missy of sleeping around. Missy replied that she hadn't, but their minds were made up. They continued to scream at Missy and to hit her and punch her. Then Laura grabbed Missy's long hair and accused her of sleeping with her boyfriend and sheared off Missy's beautiful long mane of hair. Laura stepped into the water. The other three stood on the shore. Then Karen pushed Missy towards Laura, who grabbed Missy's wrist and pulled her in. Eva panicked. She didn't know what they were going to do next, but she knew she didn't want to be a part of it. She scrambled back up the bank and waited by the car. Karen and Laura wouldn't let go of Missy. She tried to fight back, but they pushed her face down into the water. They held Missy down. The creek was shallow with only eight inches of water, but it was enough to drown their best friend. Missy died at 17. Karen and Laura reveled in what they'd done. They picked up a 100-pound log, four feet long, and placed it vertically along the back of Missy's neck to ensure they had succeeded. Karen and Laura hiked back up the bank. Karen got into her car and sped out. Eva slid into the passenger seat of Laura's car. As they drove down the mountain... Laura announced, We killed Missy. Eva was trembling and asked her, Are you sure? Laura reassured her that Missy was dead and that she deserved it for sleeping with her boyfriend. At 6 p.m., Laura called Missy's home. Irene answered and Laura asked to speak to Missy. Irene? was confused and asked her what she was talking about. Missy was with her. But Laura told her they stopped at a park when they saw two boys in a blue Camaro and that while Missy was talking with them, she left to get gas and when she returned, Missy was gone. When Missy wasn't home by 8 p.m., Irene began to worry. She waited for the phone to ring. Blue skies gave way to blackness. The only light in the canyon trickled down from the stars onto Missy's still body. Irene left the front door open for Missy and waited up all night for her to come home. At dawn, Irene began reaching out to Missy's friends phoning and knocking on doors. No one had seen her daughter. Missy was reported missing. Two days later, hikers in the canyon came across to gruesome sight. The log still pinning Missy down. Removing Missy's hair was personal and investigators immediately suspected the killer was someone in her circle of friends. They interviewed Karen and Laura. The two girls answered their questions and appeared helpful, offering leads and potential suspects. And the girls were at Irene's side when she went to the police station, and they both attended Missy's funeral. Irene couldn't comprehend losing her daughter and best friend. She spent days and nights hunting for that blue Camaro. All the while, Karen was right by her side. With Missy gone, Karen could now have 
what she always craved, to be just like Missy. She moved in with Missy's family and took her place at the Thanksgiving table. But Karen had another reason to be there. She needed to know what they knew. She was always by Irene's side so she could stay one step ahead. Karen saw their pain up front, and it didn't faze her. She visited Missy's grave often and took her flowers. She began to drink heavily and put on weight. Investigators kept working on Missy's case. Two years after her murder, they questioned Laura again. This time, she changed her story and claimed she dropped Missy off at a church not a park. Then to cover up her lie, she said she was trying to hide a drug deal. But investigators didn't believe her. They sensed Laura knew something more than what she was telling them, but they never suspected she was actually involved. For nearly three years, Eva kept their secret. Karen and Laura terrified her, so she pushed it into the back of her mind and tried to forget. But then, life took a turn, as it often does. Eva's brother died by suicide. Suddenly, with all the pain and anguish she felt, she realized that Missy's family was feeling the same way. In June 1988, Eva contacted investigators and finally told them what she knew. On June 27th, Karen and Laura were arrested and charged with one count of murder. Karen was held without bail. Laura's bail was $1 million. Money she couldn't raise, so she stayed behind bars. Shortly after, prosecutors filed additional charges against Karen for kidnapping, false imprisonment, and commission of a felony after the fact. Karen and Laura went to trial in February 1990. It took the jury only four hours to find them guilty, but of second-degree murder. Karen used a tissue to wipe tears from her eyes Laura sat next to her, her face stone cold. The jurors felt the evidence didn't prove it had been premeditated. Missy's family were disappointed. At their sentencing a month later, they both received 15 years to life. The Modesto Bee reported that Irene said, They took the most precious thing I had in life and I'm never going to forget them for that, and I'm not satisfied with the apology. Twelve years after the murder, Karen was denied parole. The board said she was still a danger to society. In 2011, Irene told the Los Angeles Daily News that she was still consumed by her daughter's loss and that she thought about her every second of every day, and that Karen should never be released, that she didn't deserve to be free because she'll do it again. A month later, Karen was paroled. She had served 21 years. Laura was released a year later. Karen wrote a book about her life In an interview with ABC News, she stated in part, I will tell you about my life. I'm the only one that could tell you. I lived it. She said Missy's murder wasn't planned and that it was about jealousy over their boyfriends and that I pushed her. I was tired. I was frustrated. All this stuff, everything we were accusing her of, she knew she did it, but not one time. Did she say she's sorry? Public outcry was swift. The book's distributor changed the price of the book to zero, and Karen didn't get a dime. 
Missy's family fought hard for Missy's law, and it came into effect in 2015. In California, family members of crime victims can now sue their killer if they try to profit from their crime through a movie or book deal. Chris, who was only 12 when he lost his older sister, remembers her as loving, outgoing, and someone who trusted everyone. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Stephen Eldridge. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Taylor Sampson. William and Taylor both dealt drugs when their paths crossed at university. William planned to rip off Taylor and dispose of the evidence in the ocean. Taylor disappeared, and William is behind bars with $200,000 in Bitcoin at stake. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Fasting Studios and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. If you'd like to support our creative, independent true crime podcast, we'd be internally grateful. Rifle through the couch cushions and donate your spare change by visiting Murder in 20 at Patreon, PayPal, or Murderin20.com. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers. <laughs>